Hi, everybody, and thank you, Stephanie, um, for inviting me to present at this uh, Soil and Vertebrate Health and Life presentation. Uh, it's really been awesome information that you and Jennifer have provided, and I'm grateful to be here. Um, so as Stephanie mentioned, uh, my name is Didi Soto, and I'm a pollinator conservation planner and NRCS partner biologist. Uh, I'm based out of Merced, California, but I work throughout the Central Valley and Central Sierra foothills with farmers and ranchers. And today I'm just going to be presenting on the programs and practices available through NRCS that benefit soil health and soil invertebrates. Great. Thanks, Didi. I'm sorry to interrupt here. Um, your, your camera is not turned on, and if you mean to have it turned off, that's fine. But in, in case you wanted to have it turned on, I just wanted to let you know that. Yeah, I leave it off because I don't like my like little picture okay. of this, the slides, but okay. <laughs> um, So just a little bit of background on the NRCS and who they are and what they do. Um, the NRCS actually started in the 1930s, um, and this was a direct result of the Dust Bowl and management practices back then. Um, we had so many issues with erosion and just the dust bowl in general was a huge problem that um, the US government took it upon themselves to create an organization um, that helped farmers and ranchers mitigate some of these issues that they were facing um, and, and really tried to promote better practices for soil health management. Um, and so they started off as the Soil Conservation Service back then. And then in 1994, I believe, they switched over to the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, and really, it was just a matter of, you know, we broadened our scope and NRCS provides a lot more technical assistance than just for soil health. Um, and it really encompasses a a broad variety of um, different resource concerns that are um, really um, viewed and, um, you know, sort of mitigated through the different programs that are available through NRCS. Um, and uh, there's, you know, as Stephanie mentioned, we look at different resource concerns and we try to address those resource, resource concerns. Um, and two of the really important ones specifically for this talk are soil organism habitat loss or degradation. And the objective with that would be to improve habitat for beneficial soil organisms. And then there's also terrestrial habitat for wildlife and invertebrates. And the objective being to improve quantity and quality of habitat to meet requirements of identified terrestrial wildlife or invertebrate species. So uh, there are different farm bill conservation programs um, and USDA and RCS provides technical and financial assistance via the farm bill. Um, and one of these uh, programs for assistance is just conservation technical assistance, which is free to producers and private landowners. Um, and it's one-on-one -on -one advice and information based on science and research where we go out and we help producers make informed decisions and really share resources and tools that are available to them to um, make better management decisions. Um, and this is a great program and resource through NRCS because a lot of those uh, financial opportunities are competitive. And so you can't always get the funding that you want but there's still assistance out there if you don't happen to get funding for you um, to get the resources that you need and the information that you need to make better management decisions. Um, you, so the NRCS also, as I mentioned, provides financial assistance. And in order to uh, qualify for that, um, private landowners or producers have to meet certain eligibility requirements. Um, and, you know, that includes like the land use that, um, you know, what you're farming or what your what activities you're, you're doing on your land. Um, and then there's certain like financial requirements, um, but an NRCS planner or 
uh, office staff can help you with all that information. Um, they also help with addressing natural resource concerns on agricultural lands and private forest lands. And there's uh, one of many acronyms with NRCS, which is SWAPA plus E, which stands for soil, water, uh, air, plant and animal and energy. Um, and so those are the various different resource concerns that we look at when we go out on a site visit and are looking um, what, what resource concerns we can address and how we can improve um, you know, those situations. And there's also uh, Xerxes and an NRCS uh, partnership where uh, Xerxes has partner biologists like me who work with the NRCS staff to provide technical assistance. Um, and we, we help with different things like habitat plans for pollinators and beneficial insects, including soil invertebrates. Um, we also do pest management conservation systems and conservation activity plans. And so we really are out there to provide uh, specialized expertise um, that isn't always available uh, through the different NRCS offices. So whenever a landowner or a planner has particular questions about pollinators and soil invertebrates and um, all those different things that we really deal with at Xerxes, um, that's when you guys call us and we, we assist however we can. Um, and um, there's also the Environmental Quality Incentives Program through NRCS, uh, and it's the short version of it is EQIP. It just stands for that. Um, and EQIP provides uh, financial and technical assistance to agricultural producers to address natural resource concerns and deliver environmental benefits such as improved water, air quality, conserved ground and surface water, increased soil health and reduced soil erosion and sedimentation, um, improved or created wildlife habitat and mitigation against uh, climate change um, by promoting climate smart um, management practices. And so um, one thing about EQIP is that EQIP is kind of like where you start if you haven't really worked with NRCS before and you're sort of coming in and maybe you have a lot of resource concerns um, that you need to address. And so EQIP is really like the starting point and the program that offers the most assistance um, and financial assistance to, to sort of manage those resource concerns. Um, and we also just rolled out a new program, which is uh, an intermediary between uh, EQIP and another program, which I'll talk about in just a little bit that's called CSP or Conservation Stewardship Program. Um, and, and this program is called Environmental Quality Incentives Program Conservation Incentive Contracts, which is EQIP CIC. Um, so this was actually just rolled out this year and uh, California is actually one of the trial states that's, that's um, sort of dealing with this program at the moment. And I believe there are a couple of other states that are also um, trialing this program as well. But the idea behind this program is that uh, it serves as a stepping stone. Um, so when you start off with NRCS, ideally you would start at EQIP and you're dealing with resource concerns and then you're improving those resource concerns and you're sort of at a little bit higher level of um, sort of good management and, and then you can um, step into EQIP CIC, which um, helps you promote more uh, practices that are beneficial. Um, but at this point, you've already um, dealt with other resource concerns and you're kind of a step above. So then you can enroll into this program to help address those natural resource concerns. And similarly to EQIP, um, you also address soil health um, and improve soil quality on ag lands. Um, you can also address habitat for wildlife and invertebrates, including beneficial insects. And you can also um, do a lot to benefit crop-based agriculture um, that will really help uh, 
uh, protect and create habitat for soil invertebrates. Um, there are also organic initiatives through EQIP. And so if farmers are trying to transition from conventional to organic, um, NRCS also provides assistance to, to help organic producers uh, both improve their operations or meet the national organic program uh, requirements. Um, and NRCS will help producers transition, as I mentioned before, from the conventional to organic based system uh, using conservation plans that are tailored uh, to, to the farmer's specific needs or the producer specific needs. Um, and that also happens by way of conservation activity plans that sort of line out uh, a management strategy for moving into or an organic system. And some of the things that uh, are, are some of the different practices available um, through the organic initiative um, are like creating or improving habitat for pollinators and beneficial insects, including soil invertebrates, um, establishing buffer zones, improving soil health and controlling erosion, improving irrigation efficiency, which is really important, especially here in California, um, grazing plans for livestock practices, crop rotations, nutrient and pest management, and managing covered crops, and also installing high tunnel systems. Um, so as I mentioned previously, there's also uh, the Conservation Stewardship Program, which is CSP for short. Um, this is kind of like the final step in, in those um, financial assistance programs, which is kind of like a series of EQIP Classic, EQIP CIC, and then CSP. CSP is something that you typically would enroll to um, once you've really done a lot in terms of uh, meeting resource concerns and mitigating them, um, and you've kind of reached a higher level of best management practices, and you've kind of, you're, you're doing a lot for, for the environment and for your land. Um, and so you enroll in CSP, and this is to, promote enhancements, not necessarily do practice standards. Um, and this is to do those enhancements. So it's not like doing a full, uh, full on practice that you have to do to meet a resource concern or to address a resource concern. This is like you've already addressed it and you're just doing things to improve um, those practices that you've already worked on. Um, so these are enhancements, which is just a little bit different. And CSP rewards producers um, that are already implementing good stewardship practices. Um, and, um, you know, they incentivize the landowners for um, agreeing to implement additional conservation practices and enhancements. Um, and another conservation program that's out there, this is a little bit more in Eastern states. Um, but there is the Conservation Reserve Program, which is a land retirement program for environmentally sensitive areas. Um, and this program uh, gives an annual payment um, for retiring that land and moving it out of production. And there's also cost share programs to install practices or apply different practices that would benefit soil health and wildlife and invertebrates and soil invertebrates. Um, and, and much like this, there's also uh, wetland reserve easements and agricultural conservation easements, which are uh, a little bit more typical here in, in California or in the Western states. And there's also resources available for or assistance available for urban farms and community gardens. Um, there's a lot of technical notes and information from NRCS and USDA and from Xerxes. So there's lots of resources out there. Um, and if you need any more assistance with this, I'm by no means an expert in, in contracting projects and, and all of that sort of <laughs> side of things. I provide the technical assistance and the expertise in, in pollinators and, and all of these practices and how to apply them. Um, but 
if you need some further assistance, you can always contact your local field office. And as Stephanie mentioned, um, there's, uh, there are field offices all throughout the United States um, and there's state offices and there's, uh, they're more of a county base. So you would go to your local county uh, NRCS office for further technical or financial assistance. And uh, Xerxes is also kind of spread out throughout the US. We have partner biologists throughout um, and staff throughout the US uh, here in California. There's myself in, in Merced and covering Central Valley. Uh, Maddie Congas is in Hollister and she covers all of the Central Coast area. And then Jessica Cruz, who's our senior pollinator conservation specialist and in Anna Murray from our Be Better Certified Program and Angela Laws are located in the Sacramento office. Um, and then Cameron Newell is down in Chula Vista, California. So, so we're pretty spread out. Um, and if you ever need some help, we're here to help. Uh, another thing that Stephanie mentioned, and this is a really good resource. Um, if you need more ideas, I will only be covering some of the practices that could be applied, but there are certainly more than just what I'm gonna cover. And the Farming with Soil Life Handbook has a great table in Appendix A, that's uh, I believe pages, pages 117 to 123 if you have the printed version. And then if you have the online PDF, I believe it's page 124 to 128. And so there's 35 different uh, conservation practices that are listed in detail. And there's the practice names with the codes, the definitions and the purpose. Um, and it's also important to note that when you look at a practice standard, there are certain requirements that you have to meet as well. So it's good to look at those. And, and all of that's also available through the, um, it's called the eFOTOG for sure, short, but if you just Google EFOTG -E uh, online for California, you can actually go through and find all of these different practices and look at the practice standards and what would be required uh, if you were interested in implementing any of them through NRCS. Um, so we'll move into a little bit to talk about the soil again, just briefly. Um, and I, I wanted to show all of you this quote because it's one that I really enjoy and really like because it's such a great quote because it portrays the importance of soil health and the organisms which inhabit the soil in a simple manner. And so, as it says, despite all of our accomplishments, we owe our existence to a six inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. And that's something that really resonates uh, with me and I hope it resonates with all of you as well because soil is really important and we owe a great deal to it. Um, and, you know, it, it does provide for our existence. Uh, we get our plants and nutrients and uh, all sorts of things from the soil. Uh, soil even has microbes that can make us even happier than what we are, right? <laughs> um, but on another note, soil is also really expensive, especially here in California, I mean, most of the producers paid, uh, if you're a farmer or rancher, you paid a lot of money for land here in California. Um, so it, it's expensive for one, but it also helps you earn your living and uh, you know make a subsistence from it. So it's really important to take care of it. Um, and that's just the point I wanna bring across to all of you is how important it is to take care of your soil and your soil invertebrates. And so, when we look at a farm or a ranch, um, I just want, want everybody to look at it as an ecosystem because it is. Anything outdoors is uh, an ecosystem, even a farm. And what's great about it is that there's so many different interactions um, going on and we can't really uh, take one single piece out and just focus on one. Like we have to look at things all together and holistically kind of um, so it's really important that you look at your farm as an ecosystem or your ranch as an ecosystem when you're trying to come up with your best management practices and how you address resource concerns. 
And so your soil is alive. And in soil science circles, um, there's there's what's there's a term for um, what's called the underground herd. And so what that refers to is that beneath every acre that you farm, there are enough organisms in your soil to equal the weight of several cows. And so you can kind of think of them uh, if you want <laughs> as a little in a way kind of like livestock. Um, and you have to consider that to keep your livestock healthy, you need to feed them and provide a good environment for them. And so similarly um, to a livestock production system, um, you know, that's going on in your soil and you need to feed your soil and you need to take care of it so that it's healthy and functions properly. And, you know, and it, in contrast, if you don't, and if your soil is neglected, your underground herd is also suffering and you may see negative effects, uh, both in crop production and in livestock production. So now we'll move into um, how to manage for soil invertebrates. Um, and so when you manage for soil invertebrates, it's important to be aware of practices that can uh, put them at risk, right? So a lot of this stuff is just reiterations of what both Stephanie and Jennifer kind of covered already, but it's important to, to keep this in mind when you're thinking about how you're going to manage your land. So here we have uh, just a simple graph of predator and prey population models. Um, and this is kind of relating to insecticides and acaricides. Um, when prey populations swell, usually the predators lag behind, um, killing off pests. Um, and when the predator's populations are peaking, it might be unnecessary sometimes to actually apply insecticides and acaricides. Um, because when they peak, they're sort of dealing with the prey and um, they bring back down those prey levels. Um, and so a good example of how things can kind of get out of balance sometimes um, is with a vermectin as it's one of the uh, sort of insecticides or uh, pesticides that Stephanie mentioned earlier, and it's used to treat parasites in cows, but it's toxic to dung beetles. And in a pasture setting, um, when there's fewer dung beetles, this means that there will be more parasites. So which in turn means that you're gonna be applying or purchasing more avermectin to deal with those parasites. Um, so it's important to sort of keep that in mind when we're making management decisions. Um, here's another example of how we need to keep in mind sort of checks and balances systems in um, the ecosystems that we manage, right? Um, so here we have a secondary pest outbreak that occurred uh, in a soybean field. Um, and what happened was this, this seed here was treated. It was, uh, the seed was coated with neonicotinoids um, and that was to deal with a lot of the insect pests. Um, but what happened was it, it kind of affected those ground beetles, right? And it affected them so much that what happened was there was a secondary pest outbreak because we no longer had those predators to deal with the slugs that we see that were eating the soybeans. So um, sometimes we have secondary effects that we don't realize at first. Um, so it's really important to keep in mind how things can affect both positively and negatively uh, when, we, when we choose to use insecticides and, and treated uh, plant materials. Um, one thing to note here in California and in the West is we do have a lot of high temperatures here in the valley, it gets really hot and it's really dry and we don't get a lot of moisture. So we have a lot of bare ground, but bare ground isn't always the best for uh, maintaining soil health and for our soil invertebrates. And in fact, um, having some cover provides a buffer or a sort of insulation against the heat 
Um, and when you just have exposed ground like that, um, this can really negatively impact the soil life and um, greatly reduce soil invertebrates and reduce the soil health. And another thing that happens is when we have bare ground, I mean, we get a lot of high winds here, so we have a lot of erosive forces. Um, so that can blow away our topsoil as well. Frequent tillage is another um, risky practice. Uh, soil disturbance, you know, can, can cause a lot of issues. It doesn't allow the soil to rest and for those uh, invertebrate populations to, um, to sort of heal and uh, have time to recuperate from management actions such as this. And so um, it also causes exposure of soil to air and sunlight and that kills off a lot of our microbes, right? So this really, can reduce soil structure. So it's important to keep um, tillage practices in mind and um, think about how we can improve those. And I'll talk about practices where that can help with that in just a little bit. And compaction is another issue. Um, frequent passes, passes with uh, equipment or heavy animal use can pack soil tightly together. And this removes coarse for space um, where a lot of the underground herd lives and it makes it difficult for roots to, to move well through the soil as well. And this, this is a common site for us here in the Central Valley. Uh, we do have a lack of habitat features and food, right? When you look at a satellite view of, of anywhere here in the Central Valley, this is kind of the image that we tend to get. Um, we don't have a whole lot of natural environments and um, oftentimes what we see is monocultures or one single type of crop or maybe just a handful of crops that uh, it's just thousands of acres throughout, right? Um, so creating habitat is really important and um, can really benefit soil health and soil invertebrates. And then another issue that we face is overgrazing and utilization. Um, so it's really important to keep in mind how we graze areas and what kind of util utilization we have, right? Um, here you can see that there's a lot of bare ground um, and this was grazed pretty heavy. Uh, this was a picture from, from this year uh, around May, I believe. Um, but you can see that there's already for one, the soils are, they, they, swell, they swell and shrink um, and they crack. And so there's, um, there's, there can be erosion. And then you see that with the bare ground, there is uh, a lot of potential for erosion there too. Um, so, so now let's talk about some strategies to foster healthy soil and invertebrates. Um, there are quite a few things that we can do to foster a healthy population of beneficial invertebrates in your soil. And in a nutshell, and this is a oversimplified, but in a nutshell, avoid bad things and do good things, right? Um, so some practices that we can apply, um, a really good one is cover crops. Um, I've seen it in a couple of different areas throughout California, but there's still a lot of bare ground, which would be nice if we had more cover crops on. Um, so cover crop uh, practice 340, and there's also CSP enhancements. Um, so cover crop 340A, 340B, or a multi-species 340C. Um, this is a great way to keep your bare ground covered, right? If we have a lot of bare ground, we can put a cover crop on there. Um, sometimes, you know, you can manage and uh, do a little bit of nutrient management with that too. If you have a perennial system that requires some sort of nitrogen uh, addition and you're using synthetic fertilizers, sometimes you can put a legume mix to provide some of that uh, nitrogen that's required for your crop. Uh, and you can do that by uh, doing a specific legume mix. Um, so some of the benefits of cover cropping is retaining water, uh, improving soil structure, and attracting beneficial insects. Um, 
and you can, you know, here in California, you can choose to do either warm season or cool season. And so the cool season will tolerate the cold and die back when it's warm. And your warm season crops, cover crops are planted after frost and, and they die back when it gets cold. Um, so most people with perennial systems use cool season here because they germinate from the rain and don't compete with the crops for water during the really hot periods. Um, and so when you consider cover cropping for cool seasons, you just need to get the timing right and uh, remember that here you would plant in the fall so that they do get the rains and they have enough time to um, get the moisture that they need to germinate. Um, and like I said, cover crops provide many benefits. They hold the soil together and increase water infiltration. They decrease erosion and cool the soil surface too. Um, they increase insect consumption of weed seeds. Um, and that's from Bill Butt all to 2016. Um, they are, if you let them flower, they can provide um, food resources for pollinators. Um, and they can also attract parasitic wasps or beneficial insects that can help um, deal with some of those pest problems that we encounter sometimes in cropping systems. Um, so you can, with cover crops, you can have flowering cover crops and multi-species cover crops. And here you can see um, all of these are going to flower. So they do provide great resources, both for managed honey beehives, if that's something that's brought into the orchard and also for our native pollinators. And um, there's always multiple benefits with cover crops, right? We, they support pollinators and beneficial insects. And here are just some of um, common cover crop plant species that are used. Um, these are all introduced, but they are great for, for a variety of reasons. Um, the legumes like crimson clover and cow pea, uh, partridge pea, they offer added nitrogen, right? And, uh, legumes can fix nitrogen in the soil. Um, and then brassicas are really good for soil compaction uh, and buckwheat is just a, all around really good for pollinators. Um, and so those are some of the options and some of the commonly used uh, cover crop species, but there are also other options available too. And um, there are some options by way of native plant species like lupines and, um, and flax and uh, tidy tips and things like that. So um, it can definitely be tailored to a specific situation or um, what the land owner is looking for. So when you do cover crops, you want to keep the management in mind and keep the insects in mind. So um, sometimes, you know, for harvest, like we want to clean the alleyways um, and you can mow instead of till, right? Um, you don't always have to do tilling as your primary practice. Um, if frost is an issue, you can high mow for frost and you always want to mow before you spray, right? If some of these covered crops are attracting pollinators, um, you want to mow it down so it doesn't attract the pollinators anymore and then you can spray, um, you know, whatever you, you are going to spray for management. And here's just a case study. This is a uh, case study from the east, but it, there have been similar studies here in California on like tomato fields, but a good example of how cover crops can um, suppress pests and provide those beneficial insect populations. Um, this was a flowering cover crop near uh, soybeans of buckwheat for nectar and it increased wasp parasitism of stink bug eggs by two and a half times. Um, so um, having a cover crop like that, that attracts beneficial insects can provide a lot of benefits to pest management decisions, right? And can uh, potentially reduce your cost in terms of pest management. 
Um, this is just a graph that was created from a trial here in the Central Valley. Um, Xerxes did some work in the Central Valley in 2018, where um, there were six cover crop sites and each was paired with a control in the Central Valley. Um, and these were all orchards and vineyards with both cool season and warm season cover crops. Um, and you can see here, the green represents the cover crop sites, the brown represents the control sites. And in the y-axis, you see the number of individuals counted during sweep net captures. And in the x-axis, you can see the type of beneficial insects that were found. So you can really see here that providing a cover crop um, or that in the cover crop areas, you really see a lot more diversity and abundance of our beneficial pollinators and also beneficial insects, right? And here's just, a, a, just an example of an actual farm located here in the Central Valley in Gustine. It's a cherry orchard, and these are photos of a cover crop that was installed in the fall of last year. So this is a cool season cover crop. And I went and monitored or just checked up on it um, this year. And it was looking pretty good despite low rains. Um, it was still doing pretty well. Um, you can also apply uh, conservation crop rotation as another way to mitigate some, and this is really to, to help with soil pests, right? When you leave a crop in and you always crop the same thing, you have a lot of pest issues and the pest populations build up throughout time. Um, so crop rotations are really useful to help manage against um, exploding uh, pest populations in the soil, right? Um, and so here uh, in California, some examples of what a rotation might look like is, uh, you know, you could have a broccoli to winter wheat to sweet corn rotation, or a wheat and then fallow to alfalfa and potato rotation, or a grass seed to small grain rotation. Um, it kind of, it varies depending on what you grow and, and what your uh, management actions are, right? And these can help increase nutrient cycling, um, manage plant pests and reduce sheet and real and wind erosion. Um, they improve water quality and reduce excess nutrients. Um, and they decrease the use, of, the use of pesticides and can improve plant production as well. Um, so, you can also do conservation cover. And so a lot of times this is a seeding application um, and it can be done in agricultural areas, but it can also be done in rangeland or um, you know, other different land uses. Um, and again, this one similar to cover crops and um, crop rotations assists with uh, re reducing erosion and increasing water infiltration and increasing soil nutrient availability. Um, and it also provides habitat for wildlife, right? Um, another great way uh, to help with soil health is alley cropping. Um, we have a lot of almond orchards here and, and different kinds of orchards. And I mean, they take time to uh, become financially viable, right? There's, there's a period of time when they're not in production and they're still growing. And something that can be done in the meantime is alley cropping by growing a, uh, an economic crop uh, in between the rows. And at the same time, it's, it's like doing a cover crop where uh, it's improving soil health, right? And also the, the landowner can also be using it for, to gain some financial income as well. And one thing to remember and to really take into account is that building soil takes time and sometimes it can be, you know, several years or many years and cover crops are great, but they're not magic, right? And they have trade-offs and they take a while to, to see, um, you know, noticeable differences sometimes. So max yield doesn't always equal max profit. Um, and so 
you know, some of those trade-offs might be that you're not seeing the yield you used to see, but maybe, um, you know, having a cover crop or some sort of other practices that you implemented could provide um, added benefits that can help you reduce other costs, right? And now we'll talk a little bit about some permanent habitat areas uh, like wildflowers and hedgerows and beetle banks. Um, here's a nice picture of a of a grass-based beetle bank in between uh, different crops. And it's just a really neat way to provide habitat for those ground beetles that are really important for uh, managing soil pests. And it provides habitat for, for other above ground species too, right? And I think we're running short on time, so I'm gonna try to go through the rest of these fairly quickly. Um, Steph, are we, are we okay on time? Um, hi, sorry, it took me a sec to get unmuted there. I, I would say, you know, you can have another um, five to 10 minutes, DD, it would be fine. Okay. All right, I, I do still have a couple of slides, so I'll try to go through these fairly quickly. Okay. Yes. Um, so here's just a good example of a beetle bank and kind of the process that goes in, into it, right? Like on the left-hand side, you see that strip that was cleared out to install a beetle bank, and they're just using transplants and providing some supplemental irrigation while these plants are establishing. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that this is a perennial um, beetle bank, so it persists through time, even when your crops aren't in production, right? And so it still has added benefits and, and permanent habitat is really great because it just allows those populations of beneficial soil invertebrates and that soil health to really grow through time. Um, so um, another practice uh, that can help um, with soil health is reduced tillage and management. Um, and, and this isn't exactly a permanent thing, but uh, it's still, it can become a permanent system, right? Um, so EQIP has different practices like residue and tillage management or reduced tillage or no-till. And it's also available through CSP enhancements. Um, and sometimes you can leave uh, residue behind. And so that's through mowing and you don't have to till the soil and move it up. And then you can plant directly into the soil. Uh, as a as a way sort of to work around uh, so much tillage. Um, there's also wildlife habitat plantings, um, shrub plantings, hedgerows, and windbreaks are a great way to provide habitat and improve soil health. Um, hedgerows through time, there's a lot of leaf litter that comes down from them, the exudates from the plant roots, uh, change soil structure, um, they, the roots help increase water infiltration, and you can see a lot of really good benefits come through and when you look at your soil, um, you know, over a couple of years, you'll see a notable difference in your soil structure and health. And so here um, on the left hand side, it's a hedgerow planting that we just did last fall, but this looks more like a meadow, right? So it, it is um, smaller perennial plants that are woody. Um, but we made it look more like a meadow system. And then on the left, on the right hand side, sorry, uh, on the right hand side, you can see more of what a typical hedgerow looks like. And this can, you know, serve the purpose of a hedgerow, but also windbreak. And so this is what you usually see when you see a hedgerow. Um, but these are great examples of permanent habitat and um, permanent management actions that have um, great uh, benefits to soil health. Um, there's also wildlife habitat planting 420 through EQIP. Um, this is a, a recent addition for here in California, I believe, um, but it's also a great way to improve soil health and provide habitat for wildlife. And um, I know that this practice can be either by seed or by transplants. And I tend to recommend transplants here in California just because it does a lot better than seed and our rain is always variable and we don't know if it's gonna come or not. So uh, transplants usually have a better fighting chance here in California. 
that's not to say that seeds won't work, but they're not quite as effective as transplants. Um, and as I mentioned before, reducing tillage is really important so that we don't disturb the soil. Um, and, and there are various different practices that can be applied um, through EQIP and uh, some of those other programs and there's funding available. Um, but tillage and disturbance of soil are really detrimental to the community of uh, organisms that live in the soil. So if you can reduce your tillage, um, it's always great. And um, that can change either by shallow cultivation and not necessarily like deep ripping. Um, and it kind of depends on what you need, but there's some options out there. Um, and you can also plant into residue, as I mentioned before, um, with crops that will allow for that. And um, another management practice uh, to with residue and to reduce tillage is um, there's this picture here is of a roller crimper. Um, if you do have cover crops and need to terminate your cover crops, you can roller crimp them instead of um, tilling them in. And um, that way you don't disturb your soil as much. And here's just a case study that is from the East too, but I thought it was a really good case study. So I figured I would use it as well. Um, and so this is just to show some of the multiple benefits of conservation tillage. Um, so here it was a 2000 acre diversified operation in Pennsylvania with 400 acres of pumpkin. And um, they, they planted a cover crop of rye and vetch to improve their soil health and support bumblebees and other pollinators. And then instead of um, tilling it in, they roller crimped it to terminate it. And then they just planted their pumpkins directly into the residue. Um, and before doing the cover crop and conservation tillage practices, they would rent honeybee hives for pumpkin pollination. Um, and that was approximately $135 per hive per acre times 400 acres. So pretty hefty cost, right? But after implementing the practices, they were able to cut back on the number of rented honey beehives by half in most fields. So they had a substantial amount of savings by just implementing practices like cover crop and reduced tillage. Um, another way to move away from tillage uh, and to manage weeds is mulching. Mulching is a great way to um, outcompete some of the weeds that we have here. And mulch also will help conserve some of the um, some of the soil moisture that's available. And that's really beneficial, especially for here in the Central Valley where we, we do have hot summers and it's so dry and hot that um, you know exposed soil tends to dry out really quickly, right? Um, I also want to mention that we should be aware of pesticide risks and try to avoid broad spectrum applications and, um, you know, try to not apply by a calendar date, but instead using uh, actual pest thresholds or economic thresholds to make those decisions. And I also want to mention that organic pesticide doesn't necessarily mean it's safe to all invertebrates or pollinators. Um, they can also be pretty detrimental to them. Um, another uh, practice that I wanted to mention is contour farming because I see that there are orchards moving into our foothills a lot and uh, it's not uncommon to see that. So, um, you know, if that's the situation using contour farming to use your land's topography to your advantage um, to really increase um, water infiltration and reduce erosion and those kinds of problems. It's really important to, to apply contour farming. Uh, and I'll, I'll briefly touch on prescribed grazing too. Managing livestock to protect soil health is really important. Uh, sometimes that, that could be a matter of, you know, going into your NRCS office and talking to your range specialist and coming up with a better plan for um, grazing. Uh, and there are other practices that you can use to improve degraded soils uh, um, and really improve rangeland sites, right? 
And managing nutrients is also really important. Um, don't over apply your NPK. Um, don't over apply fertilizers or especially synthetic fertilizers, right? In some ways that you can mitigate some of that, as I mentioned before, is by using, um, you know, in the example of nitrogen, you can use certain crops or certain cover crops uh, or plants, legumes in specific to help uh, provide some of that nitrogen that's required and thereby reduce some of your costs for some of those synthetic fertilizers that you, you purchase sometimes. And in summary, uh, there's three things that you need to provide for soil health and soil invertebrates mainly is food, shelter, and protection from pesticides. Um, those are really important. And then ways to provide it is by either providing temporary habitats such as cover crops, permanent habitat like beetle banks or hedgerows, reducing tillage, being aware of pesticide risks, um, farming with your land's topography and not against it, and grazing sustainably um, and managing nutrient applications. And then some other associated practices, um, pest management conservation systems, forest stand improvement, tree and shrub planting, windbreak shelter belt establishment, alley cropping, uh, prescribed burning, prescribed grazing, forage uh, harvest management, and restoration and management of rare and declining habitats. These are just some other um, practices that can be applied or supporting practices. I know that tree and shrub is one that I use out in rangelands. Um, and you know, access control could be another one to help prevent erosion in um, riparian areas. So there's, there's a lot of different practices out there that can be applied uh, to improve soil health. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, and as Stephanie mentioned, uh, the Farming for Soil Life is handbook um, has a great table available. And you can always contact your NRCS, your local NRCS staff to get more information on some of these practices. Um, and with that, I thank you all for having me and for the time. Uh, and if you have any questions, my name is Didi Soto and here's my email. <laughs>